to know you deeper in our hearts, Lord. And help us, O oh God, to be a student of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's my honor this afternoon, you can be seated, uh, to interview Otto Wagner to you. Otto Wagner is the past president of Life of the Lost. Life of the Lost is a partnering ministry with Honor Bound Men's Ministries with the Assemblies of God. They provide uh, evangelism literature for missionaries for all around the world and in home missions. They help us also with printing the Reese 3 Challenge card where we ask men to pray for three other men and uh, as an evangelism tool to start getting men to pray for one another, especially your lost friends. And I want him to come everywhere we have a conference. Otto comes. He's a retired banker, now turned preacher, amen? But uh, he's going to share a couple words with us and uh, talk about life of the lost and the importance of being a councilman with life of the lost. And Otto, God bless you. Good afternoon. It's just a joy to be here with you, and especially this beautiful weather that you've been having. I noticed a difference. We have quite a delegation here from Wisconsin. And we've, yes, and we've had quite a bit of snow up there. So these, you guys are dressed in leather jackets, skiing jackets, heavy jackets. Our Wisconsin guys are out there in t-shirts sun, sunning themselves. So there is a difference in climate. But it's certainly a joy to be here. And, and Chuck, thank you for uh, permitting me to just to share a couple of minutes with you about Light for the Lost. Uh, how many Light for Lost councilmen do we have here by chance? Did you raise your hand? Look at that. How, how many have you ever attended a Light for Lost banquet or a steak team banquet? Whatever? Yes, thank you very much. God bless you and thank you for that. Light for Lost is the ministry of the men's ministry of the Assemblies of God. We have Honor Bound, Light for Lost, and then we have Royal Rangers. Uh, Light for Lost provides literature to our missionaries abroad. Uh, probably all of the mission, uh, literature they use has been provided by Light for the Lost. Light for Lost had its inception in 1953. That year, uh, a man had a vision that people were perishing and they were dropping into hell and they were saying, give us the book, give us the book. As a result of that vision, he went to his pastor, then they gathered seven men, and that's where Light for Lost started. That first year, they raised $392. They were singing, and they were raising funds at the same time. They were not that good a singer, so they were not that successful. But they carried on. Friends, last year, what the Lord has done, 1953, $392. Last year, we raised $10 million. $200. And you praise the Lord. <clears throat> and we also have over 10,000 Light for Lost councilmen that pay $15 per month so that every cent that is raised for the purpose of Light for Lost evangelism goes, every cent of that goes to the foreign mission field or here at home. And we need more of you men to continue this, to reach out all around the world. I just came back from China and, and I sat back there the other night and I had actually tears in my eyes. They were going to have a men's conference in this city that I was. Again, this was they be very careful as to how they, they do not attract the attention of the outsiders. Well, they were going to have a con men's conference, but usually they do not gather in larger number than seven, seven men. But because we are foreigners, they included two more so we could have nine. Men, last night, the night before, I saw the praise and worship here, the liberty that we have. You know, from Wisconsin, we don't always go up and down, but I was just getting exercise in my feet just watching some of you guys go up and down. But thank the Lord, the liberty that we have to praise in the manner that you choose. And amen. But our friends around the world, do not have that opportunity. So we have a responsibility. Lord has blessed you. The United States is a nation that has been blessed financially in many ways. But in that turn, we have a responsibility to help our fellow brothers in the Lord all around the world. And men, it's, I thank you. Those of you that need a pen or a calendar, stop at our booth. 
We don't, we're not selling anything, we're just giving it away. And just to say hello, if you're not a Light Force Councilman, pick up a brochure or an application and take it home. And I'm sure there's somebody in your church that'll support, that'll underwrite that, you're a pastor, or just turn it, sign it, turn it in, give us $15 to start off, and you'll be a Light for Lost Councilman. You'll be receiving a spotlight, an update every month as to what is happening around the world in missions. Men, God bless you. Thank you. And it's been a joy being here just to be blessed of the Lord. Chuck, thank you again. Amen. Amen. All right, guys are still coming back. You know, they got that second water burger and the third Krispy Kreme. I'm on a diet, can you tell? <laughs> you wouldn't tell from my eating habits this week. Something about Pensacola just gets me going crazy. The gentleman that I uh, am going to honor to introduce has been my cohort in this ministry. Uh, the three years that I've been in Springfield, Missouri, since my retirement with the Secret Service. Jeff Swaim has uh, just got a heart for discipleship. You see, it's not just writing about it. He does it. He's got youth pastors and leaders all around the, the country that have grown out of his discipleship heart. Uh, he has two wonderful daughters and a wife and a uh, couldn't be more proud of him, you know, he's, nobody going to come to his door. Not without going through him, calling on his daughter. Right? Boy, I tell you, it got real quiet in here, didn't it? But I want to bring him up without any further introduction. I think, you know, he doesn't really need a whole lot of introduction. But I'm going to give him introduction. I love him. I, I tell you what, this ministry is, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's Norwegian. He has to be told two or three times. <laughs> but when you start looking at the local church manual, when you start looking at Blueprint, and, uh, and you start looking at Preparing to Win, and so what and different resources that have been compiled or written, you'll notice the name Jeff Swain. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. incredible challenge to keep you awake. Let me entertain. Okay. No. You, uh, you really don't want any more, okay? <clears throat> you never know what an old youth pastor is going to do, so it's bad. When I uh, got kicked out of youth, I mean, uh, left youth ministry, uh, I ended up in the men's department. And the word was getting around, what are you doing now, Jeff? And I said, uh, well, this guy came up to me. He said, what, what, what are you doing now? I said, I'm working in the men's department. And they said, at Sears? <laughs> That's a fact. And I, I kind of went, yeah, right. But that told me something, that we needed identity in the Assemblies of God. And we, we tried to think of a name, and we tried to use Promise Keepers, but <laughs> that was taken, all right, that name. So we came up with Honor Bound, Honor Bound, Men of Promise, and somehow that didn't float a whole bunch, so we... We resolved to honor bound men's ministries, which encompasses all kinds of ministry to men and by men. Honor bound, what is that? Honor bound is who we are, guys. We're honor bound to God, right? Amen. And we're setting that in order this week. And we're honor bound to our families. We're setting that in order this week, right? Amen. And we're honor bound to those in need. We just heard of needs around the world with life of the lost. And there's a lot of needs that we can meet in our community and around the world. 
Honor-bound men see a need, they meet the need. Honor-bound men recognize authority in their life. They pray for those in authority. You know what? I've been praying for our government leaders the last decade, not just since Saturday. Hello? All right? All of them need prayer. And also, an honor-bound man recognizes those in authority in his immediate life. His employer, hello? Also, the pastor of the church. Guys, we need to pray with and for our pastors. I believe that men that have a work of God in their heart will join with the pastor in fulfilling the mission of the church, not only to the church folks, but to the community. All right? Because the church does not exist for the church, it exists for the world. And we don't just get together and sing kumbaya all the time, right? We need to do our job in our community. But we need men that will come alongside of their pastor and become their armor bearer. Do you hear what I'm saying? And not just go out for church uh, lunch after church on Sunday and have roast pastor. We need deacons that absolutely lift the hands of the pastor, physically lift his hands and pray for him. There were three little boys walking down the street one day. One little boy said, see those apartments over there? My dad owns those. He's a lawyer. He's rich. Yep, he owns those. Well, the other little boy, his dad's a doctor. See those apartment buildings? My dad owns those. He's rich. Well, the third little kid, he's a preacher's kid. And I mean, they live in a parsonage. But he was not to be outdone. He said, well, my dad owns hell. <laughs> what do you mean he owns hell? Yeah, he came home from the board meeting the other night and told my mom they gave it to him. Men, we need to make pastoring an incredible, incredible experience for our pastors. Hello? And we need men to absolutely pray with and for the pastor. And guys, what we say and what comes out of our mouth is generated in our homes. It is. It's generated in our homes. I saw it time in, time out where there were critical spirits among the parents, those kids did not serve the Lord later on because it sows a spirit of contempt toward authority. And guys, a lot of times our own authority is undermined when we undermine authority over us. Right? Guys, my challenge this afternoon is not to hit a home run, but to get on base. <laughs> Just to get on base. But I, I was thinking this morning, uh, I went to the chiropractor, and he beat me up a while. And I was thinking a about a, a couple of things. I I'm going to do two things today. My first challenge is after the amen. When we go home, what, what's next? All right? Because a lot of time we have PMS, post-motivation motivation syndrome, <laughs> post-event syndrome, because we get supercharged. And then six to eight weeks later, we're down where we were before. And we promote the next event. Promote, promote, promote. We go to the next event. We get supercharged. Then, again. And you know what? If we're not careful, we can reduce our ministry to promotion. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of peaks and valleys in my life and in the ministry. I would like to see a continuum in our lives. A continuum of growth. And what I'd like to do is give you just kind of a list what to do when you go back home. How to keep this thing going with men's ministry. And, and then I'm going to talk about discipleship in a moment. I just felt impressed to jot down a few things this morning. I think the Lord gave me some things. Just what about after? Like on the ride, road, ride home, you could be talking about these things. And uh, because I, I believe that we're... We're not just supposed to have events, but to leverage those events 
springboard off of them. First of all, what are you going to do this Sunday? Get a plan. How are you going to honor the men that were here? Let the men testify what happened in their life. And men, if you're not here, uh, your pastor's not here, just kind of call back home. Say, Pastor, I'd like to share what's gone in, on in my heart while I've been in Brownsville. If he won't let you, don't get bent out of shape. Look for an opportunity, but you know what? Live it more than say it. All right, number two. Within the next two weeks, start discipleship. Start discipleship. One thing I did when I got young people supercharged at youth camp, instead of going the ups and downs roller coaster ride with their emotions all the time, I got tired of that. So before I got them on the bus to go back home, I signed them up for discipleship. Guys, if you're having a tough time praying consistently, you need discipleship. If you are having a tough time sharing Christ with friends and family, then you need discipleship. If you're having a tough time with your Bible study, then you need to be discipled. And guys, you need to sign up. Get a plan to start some type of discipleship ministry, preparing to win, whatever. We've got resources over here. Next thing is develop a year's plan for discipleship. Get your hands on some resources and develop the plan. I do not recommend doing preparing to win one time. I recommend uh, that a church offers it two times a year. That way you can cycle different guys through. Next, develop a devotional life. Devotional life not only in your life, but among the men. Develop devotional life. A walk through the Bible, as it were. Do you know that President Bush is walking, do the, doing the one-year Bible? Let's join with him. Let's raise up one million men to pray with him and for him for our nation. And let's sign up men everywhere to go through the one-year Bible. I believe if we do that, we'll see change in our nation. How about it? Let's get one million men. Pass the word. I don't want anybody to make any money on this. I don't want anybody to get the credit. Let's just do it and pass the word quick. And I believe with this nucleus of guys, we can get the word out. Hey, let's join President Bush. Let's pray for our nation and let's go through the one-year Bible or go through the Bible in a year. Let's do it. Also, get leadership training. Get leadership training for your men's ministry core group. Go through blueprint training. We have got trainers in every single state in the United States. Thank the Lord for that, right? Uh, Promise Keepers at the peak of their training, they had 180 trainers, and we've got 560 or 84, or something like that, trainers. And we, we keep training people how to present the Blueprint Training Seminar. And there are trainers near you. If you do not know who a trainer is, contact your district men's director, and he'll point you in the right direction. And what the Blueprint Training Seminar does, it helps you move from event-driven ministry, from event to event to event, to a process, to where you're going to have a process of developing godly men. Amen. That's what we want. To where we're not just, hey, going through the motions and just coming together for burnt pancakes, that every event has a purpose. Every event ha makes sense and will help you set up long-term goals and short-term goals. Short-term goals that lead to long-term goals and that you are developing a philosophy of ministry to where you hit the bullseye every time. You aim for a target, you hit it. Also, I encourage you to develop some kind of leadership training seminar or system within your church, get a hold of Maxwell stuff, whatever, to where you're developing leadership skills within your men. We need more men's leaders, not only in the church, but in the community, right? That are men of God. Develop leadership. Also, develop relationships with men and among men. Do not build your men's ministry on heavy programming, but develop it on relationships. Guys, this is what we're starving for. Men need relationship. They need relationship with God. Let me encourage you, develop men relationships with other men and among other men. That's a leadership uh, goal. Also, build significance within men. Allow pe people to know that they are significant to you. I recall when I was in ministry, after I'd been in ministry for three years, three and a half years, I went to a church in Albany, Oregon, where Tex Groff, Alan Groff was my pastor. He let me know that I was significant to him. Through that inter 
interchange and, and that acceptance and approval. I didn't have to prove anything, but he approved of me already. That significance, that I was significant, significant to him as a person. I knew that I was even more significant to God. It allowed me to sense the significance of God in my life. Then I knew that I could do significant things for God. That's what happens, guys, through relationships of godly men just encouraging other men. I believe in catching people doing things right. It's the lost art of encouragement. Allow people to know that they are significant to you. Hey, guys, it'll work every time. It's amazing what will happen in someone's life when you believe in them. That's where I started with discipleship with students allowing them to know that they were significant to me. Guys, there's something that happens in an individual that they're important to you as a person. Also, elevate the importance of men's ministry in your own life and in the church. Elevate it. Whatever priority it is now, take it up a notch. Take it up a notch. You already got it going. Maybe you're strong at it. Take it up a level. Elevate it, not only in your own personal commitment. Pastor, I challenge you to do that. Men, I challenge you to do that. That you take men's ministry to a new level to where you're going to reach other men. And I would love to see more and more men called to this ministry, uh, men's ministry. Also, develop a way or a method to touch base with every man every week. At least one time a week. Sometimes men... Certain men in your church will need two and three contacts a week in order to get going. Just how you doing? A phone call, a cup of coffee, significant time, one-on-one. -on -one. Develop a, a method of touching base. Also, guys, let it be normal that there is prayer, worship, intimacy with Jesus, and love for God. That he is the supreme being that deserves our supreme love. And remove all the barriers for men in your church. Remove all the barriers. Let it be a loving, friendly place for guys to be accepted. Remove the barriers. Well, what I like to talk about now are some of the things that Jesus said about discipleship. We hear a lot about it. We hear a lot of, uh, of conceptions of what it is. It's a class. It's a group of guys getting together. Well, guys, it's not just a class and not just a group of guys hanging around together and going through some workbooks. Guys, discipleship is a process of all-out commitment to Jesus Christ. It's where Jesus is changing our lives. I believe that it's different than mentoring. Mentoring, you teach someone life principles and how to, how to manage through life and different situations. But discipleship includes mentoring, but discipleship is teaching someone how to follow Jesus how to fall in love with Jesus, and how to replicate their faith in someone else. The days of saying to other people, don't look at me, look at Jesus, they have to end. We have to say like Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. Guys, that's got to happen. We have to set the example. And I believe the Christian life is more than getting forgiveness of sins. I believe it's more than saying, Jesus, take away my owl. Take away my guilt. Bless me, God. Bless me. Guys, the Christian life is an all-out sellout to Jesus Christ. It's a total commitment. In fact, look at Luke 14, 25 and following verses. Luke 14, 25. Reading from the NIV translation, it starts out this paragraph, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, I'm going to stop right there. Large crowds followed Jesus everywhere. Large crowds. because You know why? Good news travels fast. And we need more good news traveling of what's happening. Good news about this place and the revival here at Brownsville traveled and large crowds gathered. 
we're a large crowd this week. Not a humongous crowd like what we're in the Bible, you know, these crowds of the Bible, but large crowds. Now, among the large crowd, hopefully, you're going to have people making the commitment to discipleship. And that's what Jesus was getting around to. He was saying, I'm going to make you count the cost. He was saying, guys, it takes a lot to be a disciple. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be one of those people that, that get real close to Jesus, that make a difference, because it's these same guys that he said, count the cost to, and he laid out these requirements that he went on to say in the last part of Matthew, go and make disciples, and because they knew what he meant, they counted the cost, and Jesus transferred to them these principles and these commitments and these all-out sellouts that they transformed the world, and you and I are here today because of that. They made some choices. They counted the cost what it would take to be a disciple. Let's see what he's talking about. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Does that mean we go home and we're big grouts around everybody? No problem, we got discipleship going. <laughs> no, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking to the Jewish community, and they loved each other. He knew they loved each other, and they knew he knew that. He was drawing a comparison. He said, I know how much you love your mom and dad. I know how much you love your brothers and sisters. I know how much you love your wife and children, but your love for them is like, hey, compared to your love for me if you're going to be my disciple." When I shared this with my youth staff out in Oregon, one of my youth workers said, uh, I don't get it. God, God doesn't want us to love him more than our family. I said, oh, yes, he does. <laughs> yes, he does. I said, I don't get it. I said, you know how much I like coffee, right? And she said, yeah, you're an addict. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't use a dirty cup, would I? No, you'd clean it up. I said, yeah, I'd wash it up. And what if I filled that cup all the way to the top? And I was holding that cup, and somebody came along and bumped my arm. What would happen? She said, well, you'd bump, or you'd spill coffee all over yourself, you idiot. There was a lot of respect for the youth pastor there. <laughs> but I said, the same thing happens when we have a supreme love for Jesus Christ. This is what it's going to take, guys, a supreme love for Jesus Christ to where we love Jesus more than anyone we love. <laughs> and I said, our lives are like that cup that the Lord cleans us up because he's not going to fill a dirty cup, a dirty vessel. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's just and he will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is the beginning of the road to discipleship, Amen. that God cleans out our life. And tonight, we're going to have a prayer time, and God is going to clean us up, guys. It's going to be awesome. Get ready to suck carpet, man. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Say, God... It's going to just come in and clean my life up. A lot of guys, that we would grow. What's been spoken of several times this week, and I'm thinking, man, you guys are preaching my sermon. It's this, that we would have a burning passion for God. Guys, when you have a passion for God, He captures your affections. He captures your desires. He captures what, whatever, the things that you're devoted to. He captures your schedule. He captures your time. He captures your frustrations. He captures your failures. He captures your problems. He captures the feelings of inadequacy. He captures those. Wow. And the more passion you have for him, wow, you begin to capture God's heart. And he captures yours. You're like David. God, I want to be one that captures your heart. 
<laughs> and when you capture the heart of God, you begin to see things differently. Not through your, your eyes, but through his eyes. And his eyes are blurred with tears of compassion for other people. Wow. And so when your life is so full of God, guess what? God is love. You can always tell when somebody's been with Jesus. It's not necessarily how they jump around and all that kind of stuff and, hey, and shout hallelujah and show up for church and sing real good or put money in the offering. You can tell somebody's been with Jesus because they have love for each other. Have you noticed all of the volunteers around this church? That's one thing I noticed when I was down here at Brownsville, how joyful they are and how willing they are. And, and they have the servant's heart. God has done a work in them. And there's so much love that grows here. You notice that here? Man, it's changed. And so when you are filled up with God's love, and just when, when you are jarred like that cup, <laughs> by a consternation or a life's demands or some disappointment or maybe even a fight with somebody, what do you do? You spill God's love. That's what happens when you have a passion for God, a supreme love for Jesus Christ. Guys, we love God more than those we love the most. I tell my kids all the time, I love you. I have two daughters. They're 19 and 16. They're expensive. <laughs> they are. I keep telling them, boys, they're the devil! <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> but they humor me and go, yeah, Dad. But, but I tell them over and over, their whole life, I love you. In fact, I got a, an email from one of Stephanie, my, my oldest daughter, Stephanie. She's 19. Last year, one of her friends was at Southwest Missouri State University, and she got my email address, and I got this email on the road. She explained that she was in a sociology class at a state university, and they described what a dad, a model dad would be. And she said, everything they described, I thought of you. <laughs> and I thought, cool. <laughs> sure, you need money, too? <laughs> that's how I get buttered up by my own kids. And the thing is, when you love your kids, you can minister to even their friends. And I tell my kids, I love you. I love you. And I'd be driving down the road when, when they've been growing up, and i say, guess what? You love us. <laughs> I don't think they're going to understand until they have their own kids. I've got this theory, just a theory, that grandkids are a reward for not killing your own. Just a theory. <laughs> Just a theory. My kids are great. We've got simple rules at our house. Do what I say! No. <laughs> no, we, we do have very simple rules. I don't yell at them <laughs> too much. Don't beat them very much anymore either. But uh, that stopped when I... Anyway, uh, we have this one rule. You can't ride with a friend or anybody that's had their license less than six months. And students usually think, that's really dumb, man. But the only thing is, they don't make the Stephanie and Lindsay model anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, the thing is, guys... You got it over here. Yeah, it went by. It's all right. The thing is, Stephanie has, had never disobeyed one of our rules, ever. And she checks her brain at the door one day. And she's a smart kid. And she, she made a 4.89 in high school, took all these honors classes. And she's in her third, fourth semester, and she's a senior already in college. I think she was switched to birth, really. Because <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> 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 
George Flattery knows. He, we grew up together. He was smart. <laughs> I mean, I was lucky to stay in school. But Stephanie decides, hey, my regular ride has to stay after. <laughs> so I'm going to catch a ride home with Jessica. She just lives down the street. I'll just catch a ride with her. So no problem. It's only a mile and a half to our house anyway. So they get into our neighborhood, and Stephanie's feeling pretty grown up because her buddy is driving. And she says, Jessica, can I drive? And Stephanie's never even driven the lawnmower, for heaven's sake. And Jessica, in her brilliance, says, sure. <laughs> so Stephanie gets behind the wheel and normally very safety conscious buckles up. No, <laughs> she doesn't buckle up. She goes two blocks makes the stop sign and negotiates the turn and hence the word negotiate she goes two blocks and to turn down our street it's a great idea to slow down but having never driven before she doesn't know the difference between the brake and the gas pedal she slams on the gas pedal and puts jessica's car into this telephone pole she sails over the steering wheel breaks out the windshield with her head leaving much of her forehead skin on the windshield, almost puts her eye out, and it's just bubbled up. She could have been killed, and she's just dazed. She gets out of the car, and when you're cutting the forehead, you start bleeding. <laughs> well, the other two girls in the car bail out, and just Stephanie's going like this, you know. But down the road is my brother-in-law visiting from New Hampshire, and he runs up on the scene. Now, Ben would waddle. He waddles down to the street, and he, he grabs this girl and takes her inside the neighbor's kitchen, and there they are in linoleum, and he says, Miss, Miss, what's your name? We need to call your parents. Uncle Ben, it's me. <clears throat> she was messed up. Well, my wife gets down the, the street to this accident, and there's our daughter. I'm coming home early from work that day to go play golf with Uncle Ben. I come up on the scene and I'm thinking, what idiot drove that car up there? <laughs> the pastors out there, the EMTs, the cops, and the neighborhood converges. And my wife comes walking across the lawn, looking like a zombie. And I get out of the car. Oh, was Steph in the car? Uh huh. Who was driving? Steph? <laughs> and I look like a zombie. <laughs> and I go in and I go in and Stephanie's just getting wrapped up and she's all bloody and everything and Daddy, Daddy, I'm so sorry! <laughs> As if I'm going to kill her. <laughs> Too many witnesses. <laughs> I said, Stephanie, are you, are you okay? Uh, I love you. I love you too, Daddy. Sorry! <laughs> And I take her to the hospital, and I'm speechless. I'm, I'm actually 32. She took 10 years off my life. And for parents who've lost a child, I, I just can't imagine what you've gone through. And for parents like myself who've gone through a near miss, wow. I, I said to Stephanie, Stephanie, you almost took something from me today that you can't get back. What, Daddy? Your life. Don't you get it? Your mom and I love you, and rules are for a reason to protect you. We don't sit around trying to destroy your life. <laughs> I said, honey, your mom and I would die for you. You would? Yes. It clicked that we love her. Mom and Dad... Moms and dads would die for their kids, right? Dad, you'd die for your kids. Let's get a perspective here. Our love for our family is like hate compared to our love for Jesus if we're going to be a disciple. That's what he's saying. We die for our kids, but we die for Jesus. When we die for Jesus, that's a disciple. Guys, not until we're willing to give up our very lives are we in the position where God wants us. Now, my kids 
I love him with all my heart. I do. I love my wife with all my heart. With all my life, I do. But they know I love Jesus more. They know it. They're okay with it. You know why? They get a better husband and dad out of the deal. You know why? Yeah. Because in my humanity, I do not have the love that they deserve and need. In my humanity. I need God's love. I need God's wisdom. I need God's patience. I need God's wealth with these three women. <laughs> I need God. And you know what? As a dad, my kids are okay with me loving God. But the greatest day in my life will be when my kids come up to me and say, Dad, I love you, but I love Jesus more. <clears throat> Mission accomplished. They're not just going to do or not do things because I tell them so. They're going to do things and not do things because they love Jesus. It's not going to be just my rules. They're going to make up their own rules. That's what's so awesome. Raising up disciples. If you want your young people to serve the Lord, if you want your kids to serve the Lord, you want your wife to serve the Lord, if you want those around you to be impacted, you have got to decide, I am going to be a disciple. Count the cost, guys. Count the cost. You've got to love Jesus more than anyone else that you love. But he goes on to say one other thing. He said, yes, even his own life. We gotta hate even our own life. In other words, we gotta love God more than ourselves. Some of us might be thinking, hate our own life? No problem. I don't even like me. You know what? A lot of us grow, grew up not thinking very much of ourselves. We were always put down. My brothers and I, I'm the runt of three boys. <clears throat> One brother, he's taller when he lays down. <laughs> They're big boys. I'm the runt. My brothers and I, we used to put each other down all the time. I mean, you're so ugly, it looks like your neck threw up. <laughs> And, I mean, cut down jokes were standard at our house. It was bad. <laughs> anyway, I won't go into all of them, but uh, <laughs> it was pretty bad. My, uh, the thing is, guys, when we grow up being told, you're a dummy, you're an idiot, you're a bad kid, pretty soon you'll grow up believing that and you'll prove it. And sometimes growing up, nobody was there to encourage us. We were always getting caught doing things wrong. As a youth pastor, I made that our motto around church. We had over 70 youth workers working with students. And our motto was catch kids doing things right. That was our motto. Because kids get caught doing so many things wrong. It's a, we, we just wanted them to know that there was hope, that somebody believed in them. And then we could lead them to Jesus. One day, we, kids were being real jerks. I said, man, if you're trying to be jerks, you're doing a good job at it. Kind of doing that right. <laughs> the thing is, guys, we, uh, we grow up not thinking very much of ourselves. And here's what happens. We get into an identity crisis in life. And we don't know who we are. And so we try to help people have an image of us. And so we, we as, as, you know, try to get stuff or maybe a position just to pump our self-esteem up. And some people even make it into the ministry with a low self-esteem. And that's why I believe that men, we need to encourage our pastor 
Because a lot of times they try to aspire to please you and whomever because of numbers. Guys, pastors, God doesn't look at the numbers. God doesn't. He looks at hearts. He looks at hearts. Our resources versus our response, our opportunities versus our expenditure. God looks at those, those things. So many times we, we try to buy ourselves into a, a good self-esteem. And, I mean, even, even in relationships when we were a kid, it, it was like, I love you, so you love me to help me love me. <laughs> that kind of deal. When we dated somebody. And guys, we can never find our self-esteem and our self-worth from what others think of us. If we want to have a great identity... We gotta love Jesus more. We have to find out who Jesus is in us and who we are in Jesus. Who is Jesus in us? Oh, he's the one that spoke the worlds into existence. He's the one that healed the lame, healed the sick, healed the blind, delivered demoniacs. He's the one that's calmed the storm by saying, peace be still. He's the same one that died on the cross and rose again and he's coming again. He lives in you, guy. And who are you to him? Maybe you were taught you're not very much. And you don't think very much of yourself. Well, who are you to God? You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, a child of God. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And nothing can separate you from his love. And his love is supreme. Supreme love to a supreme God. All things were made for him, by him, and for his pleasure. And so many people have these doubts about this whole Christian thing. Is Jesus really God? Is Jesus really the Son of God? And, and a lot of pe people are into the supernatural stuff. And so they call these psychic hotlines. And there's a billion or two dollars there every year and spin on these psychic hotlines. Wouldn't it be incredible if maybe one of those came right on, or two, or three? Well, Jesus fulfilled over 400 prophecies prophesied about him hundreds and hundreds of years prior to his living on this earth. Josh McDowell put it this way in his book, More Than a Carpenter. He said, the chances of one person fulfilling that many prophecies is 10 to the 17th power. 10 was 17 zeros. What's that like? The state of Texas covered with dollar bills, with dollar coins, a foot thick. And if you were to mark one of those dollar bills, drop it out of an airplane and blindfold somebody and say, hey, you've got one chance to pick the right one. That's the chances of one person fulfilling all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. I say, guys, Jesus is God. So in counting the cost, in counting the cost of what, of how to be a disciple, can I serve a God like that? Can I serve a God 10 to the 17th power that only one person like him ever existed? That he is truly the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Guys, you bet you I can. And guys, if you have doubts, it's okay to doubt, but I believe in positive doubting. Find out the answers to your questions. Dig, dig. Don't just slough it off. Don't be lazy. Excel in the basics of prayer. Excel in the basics of Bible study. Excel in the basics of scripture memorization. Excel in the basics of what it means to, to share Christ with other people. Excel in the basics of multiplying your faith in other people through discipleship. Excel in those things and give God a personal best every single day. Men, last part of this passage, it says... In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Guys, we've got to forsake all 
to follow after him. Does that mean we sell everything and we become a shiftless loafer? Not at all. It means that we absolutely give God everything. That Jesus becomes Lord of all. That we set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts. 1 Peter 3.15 You cannot make Jesus Lord. He already is. Amen. And in our hearts, we set him apart as Lord. That means surrender. I surrender everything. I surrender my will. I surrender my schedule. I surrender my money. I surrender my family. I surrender the things I defend. The things that make me mad. I surrender them to you, Jesus. We need to empty ourselves. We need to not deny ourselves and take up our cross. Denial of self that self abdicates the throne of our heart and we're no longer self-centered, we're Christ-centered. That we take up our cross and identify with Jesus. What does it mean to take up your cross? The cross symbolizes the shame the persecution, the insults that the world heaped on Jesus, the Son of God, and any believer that chooses to stand against the tide of moral decay will encounter the pain of the cross. John Ashcroft is encountering the cross. He's taken up his cross. And guys, maybe we're never going to be, uh, not maybe, we'll never be nominated for Attorney General, but we'll have to take up our cross in our world, right? Identify with Jesus. Men, it's time to not just jog with the, the pack like the crowd and start sprinting for the tape. It's time to be winners. And you know what? In order to be a winner in God's kingdom, you gotta be a loser first. I am a loser. <laughs> Die to self, guys. Die to self. Raising up disciples, what's it going to take? A lowering of our hearts to the Lord and say, I humbly bow before you. Strip me of the pride. Strip me of the ego. Strip me of the selfishness. Strip me, oh God. Strip me of the sin that entangles my life and allow you to be supreme. Allow me to love you with all supreme love. Allow me to take up my cross and follow you. Allow me to love you more than I love those the most. And especially allow me to love you more than I do myself. And guys, the more Christ-centered you are, the more other-centered you'll be. And everybody around you will be impacted as a result. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these men, this conference. Help this conference not just to be a fleeting moment in our lives, that we just get motivated with all these speakers and the worship, but, oh God, may it be a, a mountain peak experience, a defining moment in our lives to where we are transformed this week, oh God, that we are set on a new pace in life, a new road. Many of us need a refreshing this week. Many of us need to repent from things in our lives. And God, we ask that you would change us, transform us, that we would be a disciple, that we would no longer just be one of the crowd called a Christian. Lord, that we would be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, an ardent follower of Jesus Christ, that we would make a difference. And Lord, that we would never, ever try to succeed at things that won't make a difference. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. He uh, lives in California. He has planted many, many churches. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you see, it, a lot of churches call it mothering churches. You know, when you plant another, you got a daughter church. 
I was talking to him last night. I said, hey, man, we got to get away from those terms. We're fathering churches. Okay? We got sons out here, some other churches. Because we are in men's ministries after all. But I asked Jaron to come and share with you about raising up cities. Because as Brother Glenn spoke yesterday about what we need to raise up in individuals, there's certain things we need to do as churches to raise up cities. And Jaron's doing it. He's in the trenches actually doing it. He is also one of the presenters you saw in that video clip last night for Dad's Coaching Clinic. We asked him to come and do that over in Phoenix, and he is, after all, you saw him leading intercession. He is an, a man with a heart of intercession and worship. And what it takes to reach our cities in today's world is men committed to intercession and worship. And it's my honor today to introduce to you one of those men, Pastor Jaron Lapasseron. Welcome him. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Lord bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. For the Lord, guys. For the Lord. Hallelujah. You bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. It belongs to you. It's all yours. Hallelujah. Before you sit down, I just feel like when, when Jeff was sharing with you here today, we're like the two spies bringing report back to an army that is ready to take the land. And the word is, it can be done. Say to your neighbor, it can be done. There has been several reports that has been given statistics about your city, about your country. But you know, when I start reading the Bible, it tells me it can be done. It can be accomplished. I'm here not only to share the scriptures with you, but I want to give you a report that what God is doing even around the world and even halfway around the world where I came from. Because the same power of the gospel, the same Jesus, and the same blood that purchases us all works. Everybody say, it works. Give a hand to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. If you would notice in your program, there are two topics that has been shared in racing the city. And Pastor Wilson was here yesterday saying to us and ministering to us and unfolding the realities of our cities today. And I am so amazed how God in its powerful work through the local church, through the pastor, and through the men that we are winning the battle one man at a time, one family at a time, one city at a time, one community and even nation at a time. I'm thankful to the Lord that there are people that have come to my nation to tell me about the love of Jesus. And when several situations had come, and even right now, politically, we don't know if next week we still have a president. There is a coup that is developing right now. I haven't checked the newspaper, but anytime there will be another bloodly, bloodless or bloody coup that will happen in my country. But I believe that this is ordained by God so that we can be alert as a church. Now, I moved to California for one reason. I want to return the favor that you brothers have done to my country so I can touch your city that we can do it together shoulder to shoulder and bring the lost. I see the multicultural diversity and ethnicity of all of our cities. And I believe that God has raised up the different cultures in our cities to stay the purpose as the Bible says that he has already purchased men from every tribe, every language, every people, already. He has purchased. And what has to be done is to deliver the word, to speak the word, to tell them it has already been done. And tell your neighbor it has been entrusted to you. Tell that. You're the guy who's going to tell them. 
I'm honored to be here not only to share the word, but at the same time, know that our movement, the Assemblies of God, has been obedient to the missionary call. I'd like to ask a missionary friend, Dr. Wesley Weekly, if he would come up to the platform with me. I know he doesn't know this, but I invited him. Dr. Weekly, would you please come? He's one of our Assembly of God missionaries that come here, right here from Brownsville, Florida. What happened is that he came to my country, came to my city, and told the nation about the love of Jesus. And what you are seeing here today, man, is that the gospel can go around the world and come back to you. Yes. Amen. And what you have invested in mission and what the Lord has done in our movement and with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in changing lives, in changing and taking cities and the nation, it is done to men and people that are willing to obey God's word. I was a little boy when I saw this man brought his guitar made in USA or either Florida <laughs> with his wife with the accordion and started singing and I thought to myself hmm uh, I like to learn how to play the guitar I like to learn how to sing and to cut the whole long story short I started singing his songs but little did he know that through the songs that he wrote and sang you know, in those crusades and meetings that he does in the church where my dad was pastoring was beginning to penetrate to my heart. And now the Lord has just marvelously used the seeds that has been planted in my heart as a little boy. Now we're talking fathering here ever since. I'm thankful to the Lord. My father right now is like 68 years old. He is planning, has already planted six churches in Tokyo, Japan. And right, and, 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 and I believe that the Lord has raised us up as a family in planting churches. And I thank, I'm thankful to the Lord that he is, Dr. Wesley is one of the men that touched not only my personal life, my family, but many people and nations of the world. I'd like, I like for him just to share a little bit of what the Lord is doing in his life and in touching the many nations of the world and the cities. In a brief way, sir. One of the wonderful things about being a missionary is having the opportunity to share the gospel with men. Or, and I shouldn't say, you know, when he was a little boy, like you said, but now when you see him today, you don't think he was ever little. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is a great man. I've been knowing him since he was just a little fellow. Now, you see, I was young back then also. That's the reason I can say that, you know, I'm still so young. But anyway, his parents, wonderful parents, his dad, a wonderful preacher of the gospel, and we worked together in the Philippines uh, down on Panay, I believe That's it was true. in the island Panay, many, many years ago. And uh, I, we had radio programs, we preached to open air crusades, and we saw God do tremendous miracles, and we planted many churches. Now that's been going on for a long time, but in the last three years, God has helped us to build 40 more churches in the mountains of, uh, of Mindanao, southern Mindanao, among tribal people. And those church churches are flourishing today, and they have tribal pastors that we're training. We have been training, and those pastors are leading those churches. You can find entire villages that have turned to the Lord just Amen. by the brief preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ where the seed has been planted and the fruit has come forth. This man right here is a testimony of what the gospel does around the world in many lives. Hallelujah. Even now we are building a new church in Bekis Chaba, Hungary, uh, where we started a church under, under communism where you could not do anything publicly Everything had to be done behind closed doors, but God put it in the hearts of people Amen. when they could not worship publicly, and they served God, and when communism fell, the auditoriums that had been built for the communists to use for their cultural centers became available for evangelistic centers, 
and we started preaching the gospel from those communist centers and building churches in, in Hungary, praise God. That church is growing, it's flourishing, and we could give you testimonials of many others that are doing the same thing. But I want to give thanks today to God for raising up Jaron Laposeron to be a great leader, a great man of God, and God has put his anointing upon him to serve him around the world, and he's touching now the lives of many people. And Jaron, may God continue to bless you and prosper you, brother. God bless you. Why I have to bring the dear pastor, missionary, to tell you it works. To tell us today that it continually works. An island boy like me coming to Los Angeles, California to plant a church, to take the challenge of the city of America, where I was landing with my family, coming to Los Angeles said, God, what am I doing in this big, big city? I have 12 million in my city in Manila. And it looks like I have fought the bear, I have fought the lion. God has allowed us to plant 15 other daughter churches within the Manila city. The Lord has our church services. We have five services on Sunday. We start at 6.30 a.m. in the morning and end up 11, 11.30 in the evening nonstop throughout the day. You want church? You can visit the church in Manila. But the Lord told me to leave the church. We have discipled young men from their high school, now in, in, in Bible school, and I have, we have to turn over the work to able and capable men who are willing to teach and raise up other leaders. Two years ago when I went home, I was privileged to witness with my two eyes 15 of the men out of the 25 of the men that prays with me every Saturday morning at 5 o'clock. And 15 of those men went to the district office to file their application to be full-time credentialed ministers with the Assemblies of God. When we talk about discipleship, when we talk about being able to raise men and women, that will take our cities, that will claim our city back, that will raise our home. I believe that we have enough resources and people right here in this room to be able to take the cities of America and offer it back to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say amen to that. I'd like for us, before we take the city, before we be able to raise the city, Pastor Wilson was mentioning in Joshua, and before they had to take the city, it was mentioned there that in Gilgal, in chapter 5 of Joshua, chapter 5, verse 2, there was explicit instruction that before they had to take the city, verse 2 says, at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise Israelites again. Why? Because these are those that were born during the journey and that they have to reaffirm the covenant and their call being the people of God. Second reason, not only that there will be a renewed covenant, but it is a sign to them that they are the people of God that had been called to do and fulfill its purpose. Third reason why blood has to be shed in the land for the redemption of that land to be captured. There is enough blood shed in our cities that it will take the blood of the Lamb of God to be able to redeem back the cities. And God has placed the church as a testimony of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when God places, and look at, look at the, the new banner that they place, that when God places a believer in the community, when God plants a church in the city, he, God, staking a claim one more time in your city and in your nation. He's doing that through the church to every believer. And I believe that as we experience redemptive work of Christ, 
the washing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. We are that state. We are that testimony that brings about the redemptive work of the Lord in claiming the cities for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not just so we can have statistics to plant church. We're building people. We're interested in restoring lives. And for that matter, once again, the Israelites has to know who their God is. But if you would see and look back, there has been a train of blood. And there's not enough time to be able to cover that. But you know, the first bloodshed and the first murder. And when it, it was there, we can see that in Genesis chapter 4 verse 10, that the blood that was spilled out of murdered Christ out of the ground. Could you begin to feel the grounds of your city crying out for the blood of those that had been killed and murdered unjustly? It has to be answered. It has to be dealt with. But no courts would be able to do that. But when it's brought before the throne of God, something happens in the heavenlies. God brings his own justice in the hearts of men, not in the courts of law. Justice is being restored in the hearts of men so they can treat each other well. So now they have a right perspective of knowing the purpose of God and the call of their lives. We can see the first city, how the first city was built. In Genesis chapter 4, just beginning on that, in verse 17, it says this, that when Enoch was born, in chapter 4, verse 17, Cain lay with his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain, Cain was building a city and he named it after his son Enoch. This is the first mention of a city that is being built. Built by bloody hands. Could you imagine what is the destiny of a city built in murder? Could you imagine the destiny of homes and family that lives in the kind of an environment of this kind of spiritual setting? We as the people of God that has been entrusted with this gospel has to come back and speak the word that shall reverse that which has brought curse to this land. And all the word that has been spoken about lives, people, homes, and family is to restore its to original intention and purpose on God, on how God has called us to himself. I believe that the setting for the time and for the season is ripe and right. Is ripe and right. There has been a turn of events. From the day I came here, there was a proclamation that the drought is over. We all agreed with that. Now Jeff following here today gave us homework on how so we would be able to put into action that which God has already started in spiritual momentum. And God is using still whenever he has a great job to be done, he talks to men about it. He has to talk to people as instrument about it. And I pray that as we go back to our cities, we would know what it is to be able to take that city, one person, one man at a time. So here we can see that when now the people of God is ready to take possession of that city, they have to be renewed in that covenant of how they had been chosen. So that one more time, the spiritual sensitivity of their hearts, the, sp the spiritual sensitivity of their own consciousness of who God is, will come into their hearts that they are the people chosen to be able to take this land. I believe that it is possible, it has been done, and it's continually being accomplished. I'm on my fourth year in Los Angeles, 
and we are in the process of planning our third congregation. The Lord on the side, when I went to a trip for New York, we were able to plant also a church in New York. Right now, I have an invitation with a group of nucleus of families to plant a church in New Jersey. In the same way in Las Vegas, Nevada, in the same way a group of believers there are there right now waiting if there could be a pastor. Different cities here in America had calls for this multicultural and ethnic ministries to be initiated. But something happened at the close of this year and at the at close of last year and beginning of this year. We were existing for three years now, a church with people, vibrant, growing, but without a building. And we felt that this is the purpose of God, that we truly would build people. There is another church somewhere in the city in Los Angeles that had been praying, God, 40% of our neighborhood now has become Asians, but we don't speak Asian. So Lord, send us people who speak their language so as a church in the city, we could be effective. And Pastor Wilson, they opened the doors for us and say, we want to rent your facility. And the dear pastor friend now who has become my senior pastor, I tell you the rest of the story. He said, I, we don't want for you to rent, but you can have the church for free. <laughs> if we want to get the job done in taking the cities, could somebody stand to those two doors right there and then swung it open wide? There you go. But, the doors, come on, open it. There you go. The doors of the church has to be open to the nations of the world. The doors of the church has to be open. Keep it open, thank you. Keep it open. I want it as a literal testimony for you to acknowledge that if we close our doors to the nations of the world, they would go someplace else. You talk about the move of Islam in this country, it's, it's God's grace and power to stop and be able to, to halt it. The work of the many isms and many ideologies and all of these people from different nations of the world will find them very, very, very acceptable if we keep our doors closed. But here is a standard American church that had opened their doors and say, we will be multicultural. We will be opening our, our doors to any tribe, any language, any people. I believe that spiritual circumcision took place in that church. January 14, 2001. Officially, the Filipino multicultural ministry has been accepted as members of that local body. And he said, pastor and the whole congregation has been given not only equal rights and privileges in everything about that church. I'd like to honor the pastor that he's also the sectional director of Honor Bound. His name is Pastor Jeff Campbell. And he is the guy that have a vision for his city. And I believe we brought in a coming together there has been a lot of talk about unity, but I don't get to see it. I don't get to see it. But right before me at the beginning of this year, I saw with my two eyes. And folks, it can be done. It, I got good news for you. It can be done. As soon as they opened the door, I said, Pastor, we want for you to take charge of, of Sunday night service. Yes, we will add more services. What's going to happen? We might have services every night. We might have services just throughout, even including Saturdays. As soon as I get home, the first Saturday of February, we're going to have Filipino services Saturday night. Because now from Sunday morning, we have English, then we have Hispanic, then we have Korean, then we have Filipino. We are raising our city. And people have to have the testimony that if they see the love of Jesus, 
if they will see that we are one, truly they would know we are his. We are his disciple. It's beginning to take action in the community. When we got there the first Sunday, we did not know that, that, that Pastor Jeff arranged a banquet in a Chinese restaurant and fed and have a feast together. And it surprised the whole community. And a, and a Chinese uh, owner of the restaurant said, wow, you know, I, I got a uh, Sunday morning, you know, you don't get that much people the early at 1130, but all of us were there. Of course, it was prearranged. But it is something that's beginning to be aware, even in the business community. And now they're talking about, say, hey, it's not only an American church. It's a Korean church. It's a Hispanic church. It has now become Asian Filipino church. And I believe it was not only a testimony for that city and community, but it, has, it was a testimony to the heavenlies to shake the principalities and powers of the air and say, we got an open heaven in our city because the people of God start to come together as one in the body of Christ. Amen. Spiritual sensitivity has to come to the church one more time. We're not just so, so it can be to our pleasure. Second, circumcision was commanded so that there can be reproduction. I'd like for you to, when Ishmael came, Abraham was not circumcised. When, when Isaac, and I'm sorry, when, 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 when the situation has come now, that in order for the promised son has to come, First, he has to be circumcised. And you know how old he was? 99 years old. When, Ab when Abraham, when Abraham has to be circumcised again in order for Isaac to be born. But because before Ismael was the one. And I, I believe that God wanted not only spiritual sensitivity, but God wants the churches to be reproductive, to multiply. When we go into the book of Acts, and how the church made a response, and when we plant these churches, when the Holy Spirit was given day one, the New Testament church become the first day multicultural. First day. Listen to this, Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews, from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in their own language. Each one heard with divine spiritual enablement. First day. The New Testament is cross-cultural by the power of the Holy Spirit. It was able to communicate, and that's why the crowd came to gather, because there was a cross-communication of the message. If they did not hear them talking in their language, would they come? But they, oh, that's my language, that's my tongue. By divine, powerful empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we could see that it was God touching the New Testament church so it can address the multi-ethnicity of the city of Jerusalem. Without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we could not address this issue. It will take the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. And for that reason today, we want to say, God, may your Holy Spirit May your Holy Spirit be poured out so that we together would be able to raise up our city so it would be restored to its purpose. Whenever Antioch, Samaria, and the rest of the other cities later on had become the base for missionary endeavors, for the simple reason they were strategically situated in economics, and in transport so that the, the spread of the gospel, your city is strategic to the spread of the gospel. 
Your city has an influence in your state, in the people that lives there. It carries on a personality. And I believe that as God gives us the opportunity to see our cities in the way God looks at them, we would be able to bring lives, homes, and families together. There are a few things that I would like to share with you on how the Lord has made an impact on my own life. I said, Lord, how shall I minister to the cities of America? The Philippine setting is different. The, the barrio or the village is different. The Lord began to speak to me. I said, yes, son, the principle is the same. The content is the same. You just have to repackage it. Okay. I said, Lord, my heart is full, full of you in worship. I like to worship. He said, well, bring worship to every house. Bring worship to every home. Would you believe that when we go to homes, we bring all of this? Could, could, you, could you imagine me in the living room? All of that. All of, we bring the piano, the drums, and we bring all of that. And whenever we come to a home, you would not believe. It's like a fiesta. And so neighborhood knows exactly as long as we're over by 10 o'clock. And several times they call in the police, yeah, especially when our young people are there, and the police said, oh good, pastor, we'd rather have the young people in here there than out in the street. Keep on. But bringing worship in every home, every home has become an altar of worship. I don't have to wait for them to worship on Sunday morning, because in their homes they're already worshiping. So when they get to church, you know what they're doing? They're fired up already. I don't, have to, I don't have to warm them up in two or three or four songs. When they got there, they're already warm up. Because there's worship. There's already incense burning in their homes because they know what it is to worship. There, there was the repackaging of worship. But then, Lord, what else? Bring worship to the parks outdoors. Can I do that? You know, the laws here are different. In, I, my dad would, I, when I was a little boy, he would put me on the top of the accordion box. He would play the music in the streets, in the market, and I will sing, and people would gather. No advertising. He preached, people get saved, church planted. That, simple. Here, he, I... When I came to America, I had to think of the laws, the police, and everything. I said, God, uh, how will you do it? Just go to the parks. And the Lord showed me we're in the city of Fontana for a church, third church that we're planning now. They usually have international festival. And I thought that was a key door, international. They, they would want a Filipino. They would want a, 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 a multicultural presentation or what. But I said, we purchase a space. You know, it's just like a swap meet. We purchase a space, and we said, we're going to set up our, our Filipino music. But then we had a big table. We put all Pentecostal evangel on the table. We started singing worship to the Lord every now and then, English and Filipino and all of that. They start coming. We don't have to chase even with tracks. People will come into our booth in our table and would read. We have a track, accept the Lord Jesus Christ, give them a Bible, and then plug them onto the church. And so when we start doing that, I said, Lord, it's true. It works that when you are lifted up, what does it say? will draw people and so guys it can be done it works we can raise our city back bring worship not only into the home but bring worship into open space people can see people would know people will see the light I said Lord I know we can do it because we have stuff we have all of this instrument but what if I'm only by myself? October, I started asking a few questions about what really God wants for America. So one day, he said, I was sitting at a coffee shop in one of the malls. And the Lord was saying, wait here. Okay. I started reading my Bible. I said, Lord, how are you going to bring the crowds? You see, how, how the 
empowerment of the Holy Spirit would bring the city at the doorstep of the church. But the Lord was saying to me, I'll start it one person at a time. After one hour, sit it there. I said, the instruction was, I will bring somebody to you. After an hour, nobody showed up. Okay, Lord, but I'm going to be here. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible. Two hours passed. Nobody. On the third hour, uh, there was somebody sitting at the table on the other side, but didn't get to talk to me. Then later, they greeted me, say, good morning. I said, Lord, this is it. When, when they greeted me, good morning, and all of that, I didn't let them go. I end up preaching my message in Starbucks, first time. I preach a message right there and shared with them the word, led them in prayer, and said, and I, I gave a prayer about their marriage, about their relationship. And usually I would anticipate a response from the lady, from the woman. But you know what? I got a response from the man. He turned, started turning red, and his eyes were starting bulging, you know, and said he's about to cry. And the, the wife was saying, honey, not here, not here. Honey, not here. This is an open place. But he was starting, you know, to just be able to respond to the word of God. And right there, the coffee shop started praying. And recommitted their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, why, why I'm sharing this with you? Because at that day, in the day of Pentecost, the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the church was so strong that people came together. There is much attraction of the presence of God in the body of Christ, in the people of God, in the homes of believers, that people will come to you. The reason why I've started, as I said, Lord, you know, I don't know if they will, the whole system on how in the Philippines I have no problem in the context of approaching people just like that. But here in America, it's, it's, it's quite different. But I said, Lord, I'm, I want to see more of your power works on how you bring the people. And the only thing that the Lord requires that I will be sensitive, that I will be open, that I would be able to know his heart. I said, okay. Another time I said, get your guitar. There was a basketball game that our young people were doing in the park, and so they were there. After like two hours, I said, just grab your guitar and, and worship under the tree or something. So I just there in one of the picnic tables, you know, all the guys. It was not a designed evangelistic outreach. No, it was not. It's one of the times where our, our, our young people will gather. As, as a pastor, I was just there to be able to co provide them companionship. I started singing and just worshiping. Then later on, I see one person started to come close. I said, okay, maybe he wants to watch the basketball game. But after that, I said, he was coming closer to me. So I kind of sing a little bit louder. So now he hears the words of what I was saying. And then he said to me, are you from a church? Yes, and I happen to be the pastor. After which that I shared with him say, and presented the plan of salvation, I have a track with me and shared with him. He gladly accepted the Lord and all of that. He, he came to the Lord and then, can I have your name? And this is where my, the shocker came. And what's your name? Jesus. His name was Jesus Rodriguez. You know what was happening? He said, see son, if you will worship, I show up. You see when you worship, I, I purposely brought a man to this park bearing my name just to tell you that when I'm lifted up, you see the cross, when it's lifted up in the city, it will draw men. I don't want for you to take the significance of these banners because it speaks a message. So when I was just there lifting up the name of the Lord, one person, could you imagine how the angels had a concert that day in heaven for Jesus Rodriguez? But it didn't stop there. Jesus said, I have my sister. I bring him over too. 
So sister accepted the Lord same day. Uh, where are you go? We have worship rehearsal. I go with you. Worship the rehearsal. Then the next day, we have church. He went to church and day in, the, uh, day out. Then he started coming to the rest of the ministry and uh, of the church. Why? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit that is embedded in the body of Christ and in the message of the gospel. I believe that we have enough tools in our hands. We have enough encouragement that even we have received here. But it's high time that we take them out there. You know, try it. Try it. Because God wants only vessels that would be obedient. I don't know how the Lord will instruct you to raise up his banner. I don't know how the Lord will instruct you to raise up your testimony so you can win the city, you can win the neighborhood. I believe that God will give us open doors in our city so we will be able to stake a claim that we will be able to claim them back. Today, we have put our, our, our horizon not only into the cities, but I believe that there are people in our churches today, men that are ready and ripe. Given the challenge, given the training, given the, given the opportunity, they would be able to do and accomplish what God has set for the church. There has been one, there has been one prevalent thing that has been happening here. And when Pastor Jeff was mentioning about, you know, uh, undergirding the pastor that really ministers to my heart because I'm a pastor and I know that there are pastors in the house as well could could we just have the pastors stand stand up please if they're here can, can I ask something I, can I invite all the pastors to be gathered here in front? I want for us to see a literal, literal picture of what is taking place. Just the pastors gather. If they could be all together, just in the middle right here. Okay. The rest of the men will all stand, please. We don't have enough space, but if all of you men could just huddle together right here, give us space. Can we surround them? Just enough men. Okay, come, come close. Surround until here. I want for you, no, no, no don't lay hands. We're, we're not praying yet. We're not praying. Yeah, surround him until here. I want for you to link arms, but link arms, face him at the back like this. There you go. There you go. There you go, wonderful, right there. Let's make a circle around the pastors. If you could, okay, there you go. You, okay, there. You see that? Are, are we making that circle over there so we can enclose all the pastors inside? Do you see how they link arms like this, man? You see that? What has been being spoken here all throughout this time, that men in the church be able to undergear their pastor and surround their pastor and support their pastor. We don't have eyes to look at their back so to see what's happening, but you will be there. And if I would be an intruder wanting to penetrate and wanting to hurt your pastor, you get, you get it first, right? Pastors, we love you. And God, through this conference, is raising an army like this. Amen. So if the enemy wanted to come in, if the enemy wanted to come in and hurt the pastor, can't do it. Because the men had been raised up to be able to stand with their pastors side by side, shoulder to shoulder, embracing their city for the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men, when you go back home, your pastor is not here. In one of your prayer time, I said, Pastor, we want, to, we want to not only demonstrate to you what it is our heart, but what is our commitment. You see, I see all of you men come and pray before the services. Sunday, coming Sunday morning, when you get back to your churches, hit the altars right away. Hit the altars right away. Bathe the altars with your prayer. 
pastor would know that. His preaching will be different. His confidence in being able to handle, handle the word of God and be even taking exploits and new things in the name of the Lord because you're there backing them up in prayer. I believe that God has given us the opportunity to be able to do this. One more time. I need three guys to get that banner right there. Three guys. That, that, this one banner. Pastor Wilson, please join me. Because we're, we're the two guys that talk about this topic, man. <laughs> I'd like to ask my brother to pray. It, can, yeah, yeah, can you take that out? I'd like that to be planted right there in the middle and raise it up. I'd like to take a statement and a testimony that we will take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and stake a claim in every city of America, every neighborhood and every community we are in. Come on, bring that here right in the middle. And pastors, you will be faithful in carrying that message. You will preach the cross. You will preach the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will preach the word of God in a shame and plan and stake a claim that this nation is truly under God. Hallelujah. Bring it in the middle, facing that way. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There you go. And everybody just raise our hands to the Lord and begin to thank and pray that we are claiming and raising our cities back. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Shake the cities of America. Oh, to take back the cities of America, God. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God. We claim every culture. Hallelujah. Every nation, God, Hallelujah. whom you have sent to America, God, for a purpose. Even if on the day of Pentecost, oh God, Father, we thank you right now because you, through us, are going to shake our nation again. And through this nation, you are going to shake the world, oh God. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. We claim every soul in our sins, Hallelujah. oh God. Hallelujah. Every boy, every girl, yes. every man, every woman, oh God. Yes. We claim it, God, yes. for your kingdom. Yes. Bless every pastor. I know every pastor, oh God. Put a spark in every pastor, Lord. To look out in their cities, oh God. And ask you for the same God. In the name of Jesus, put a spirit of Caleb and devil, God, yes, yes. and call them to act for the mountain. Give me that Alleluia. mountain. Give me that yes, city. Yes, yes. Oh, In the name God. of Jesus, and if the Lord be with me, yeah. I'll be able to take that city, God. Father, I thank you right now. Thank you, God. Jesus. Thank you for the vision of honor bound. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, God. Here, here, here's what I want you to do. You know, in your own mind, just, just, just take a walk through your own city right now. Just, just walk your city right now and begin to ask God for, for those avenues, for those streets. For those, come on, just, just, just take a walk. Come on, come on, just, just take a walk through your cities right now and begin to say it's mine. Point to the projects and say it's mine. Oh, God, hello. The drought is over.
Father. Holy Father God, we're raising up an army of committed warriors for your name. We're raising up an army, oh God, to take the nations. Not just one nation, but every nation. We're raising up an army, oh God, to take our cities, our communities, to take our workplaces. God, it's not about church as usual. It doesn't have to have a beautiful building. It's talking about getting out into the marketplace and bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to every living person. Father, we ask you to enable us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Bring about an anointed move upon the men of the Assemblies of God, the other denominations, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, every, every, every church that calls on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, raise up a mighty army that doesn't look at the color of the skin or the language that we speak. But Father, instead, raise up an army led by God's generals. And Father, bring the soldiers to surround them to protect the leadership of our army. Father, we ask you right now, we cry out for souls. We ask you, O oh Lord Jesus, to bind the enemy. Take away all the obstacles for us to feel competent to worship, to evangelize. Father, give us a feeling and presence within us of your Holy Spirit to be able to open our mouths and you will speak through us. And Father, we don't have to lead a man to our pastor. We have to lead a man to Jesus Christ. And Father, fill us up with a, with a heart for missions, both foreign missions and home missions. Let us see that there is, there is, like Brother Wilson said, there is Africa right here in Pensacola, Florida. There is Asia right there in Los Angeles. But Father, we also know that there are millions of people worldwide that need help, and we need to be a blessing flowing through us and on to the outermost parts of the world. And Father, bless us indeed. Enlarge our territory. Keep your hand with us. Protect us from the enemy. And let us cause no pain. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah! Hallelujah!